Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Sabrina Ho. I'm the founder and CEO of Half the Sky, Asia leading career platform for women. And thank you all so much for being here today. We're so excited to be celebrating International Women's uh, Month for us with this great webinar, Thriving in a New World of Work. And also, I would like to thank uh, the audience joining us from 14 countries. And that includes uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, Philippines, Japan, Indonesia, India, Portugal, US, Canada, and Germany. I'm sure a lot more uh, audience will tune in later on. So just some housekeeping rules before we start. Um, so these sessions will be recorded and please make sure all the participants, you remain muted and your camera is off throughout the entire session. So the spotlight will be on the speaker. And if you have any questions um, during the session, please leave them on the chat box and I'll read it out for you during the Q&A. Okay. So for those of you just joined, um, hello everybody. Uh, this is Sabrina again. I'm the founder and CEO of Half the Sky, Asia leading career platform for women. So today is my great pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, Achana, Tani, and Johan to share their thought leadership with us. So please allow me to introduce our first speaker. Her Excellency, Jo Tindo, is currently the New Zealand High Commissioner to Singapore. She was previously New Zealand Climate Change Ambassador and co-chair the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change at Hot Working Group on the Paris Agreement. And prior to her role as Climate Change Ambassador, Her Excellency was also a CEO of three organizations, including New Zealand Broadcasting Funding Agency, the Screen Production and Development Association, and Project Blue Sky. So welcome, Her Excellency. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Very good to be here to do, to, today too. Thanks, Sabrina. <laughs> and next up, we have Achana. So Achana is currently head of platform and agile transformation at CBS. She's leading public cloud adoption at CBS Consumer Banking and Big Data Analytics Technology. Achana is also the champion for gender diversity at CBS Technology and Operations. Um, Achana graduated with a degree in computer science and engineering. And then she went on to do her double master's from the London School of Economics and the London Business School. She has worked primarily in London and in banking and financial services technology in various international banks such as Citi, JP Morgan and Barclay. And she currently lives in Singapore with her family. And she's also a mother to a 15 year old daughter who is a young and budding entrepreneur herself. So welcome Achana, it's great to have you here with us. Today. Thank you, Sabrina. Okay, and our third panelist, Tani, is no stranger to our community because she spoke at several of our events previously, and UPS is also one of our diversity employers on our platform. So Tani is the Asia Pacific Vice President of Human Resources for UPS and responsible for the overall human capital strategy for more than 13,000 employees across more than 40 countries. And with more than 25 years of HR experience across Asia, Europe and US, Penny is also an active advocate for women's leadership development, diversity and inclusion. And in her free time, she enjoys coaching and mentoring and spending time with her lovely family. She lives in Singapore with her husband and daughter. So welcome again, Penny. Thank you, my pleasure. <laughs> and of course, last but not the least, we have Johan with us today. So Johan is the Global Vice President for ABB's Oil and Gas Business and Managing Director for Singapore. Johan and his team is responsible for strategy, technology, and the go-to-market approach for ABB's Oil and Gas Business. And Johan and his team uh, was responsible for driving growth, growth across all five ABB divisions in Southeast Asia. Johan was a member of the Singapore Government's Future Economy Council Manufacturing Subcommittee. Um, and serve on the board of the EU RCM Business Council. He also served as an advisor at uh, National University of Singapore and Nanyang Technological University. So welcome, Johan. We're very excited to have you here. Thanks, everyone. So question number one, panelists, what will be the biggest changes in the workplace post-pandemic? So I'll go ahead and kickstart with this question, Sabrina. So 
you know, we are talking about post pandemic and we're talking about changes at the workplace. So if you ask me, I'm gonna summarize into a few points, key points. The first one I would look at would be the ability to re-collaborate amongst the workforce. Because as you can imagine, during pandemic, we are all isolated, work from home, you know, and, and for those essential services, you know, they are busy trying to get the supply chain business going, trying to get the, you know, medical healthcare going. So I think as we slowly go back to the post pandemic situation and when business starts to resume slowly, I think we need to re um, engage each other, recalibrate in terms of how we communicate with each other. I think this will be the key changes, one of the key changes that I, I foresee. The other one is the corporate culture will change for sure. Because in the past, you know, it could be very uh, economic driven, business results driven. But right now, I think the corporate culture has changed to the extent where mental health, for example, is one of the key topics and the key concerns for most employers. So the culture of more inclusive, the culture of uh, looking into the mental health of employees, the culture of a lot more collaboration, like I spoke about earlier, will be expected. And the last one I want to point out and, and I want to single out is security. And I'm mainly focused on cybersecurity because this is one of the key risks, you know, when we are asking employees to work from home. You can imagine, you know, we are allowing um, employees to access company servers, co company confidential information from home and even printing, you know, documents, and do we allow to bring documents back home? You know, stuff like that. The, the security of company information, I think uh, those are the policies I think many companies were already started looking at. But I think post pandemic, there will be a lot more scrutiny and tighter uh, security um, practices and policies should be coming in place. So in a nutshell, I, was, I will highlight those three. Good. Any panelists want to want to chime in? Let me oh, just this. add to that, Lena. I think. Um, sorry, um, Your Excellency. Do you want to go ahead? No, no. Wait for wait for you. Okay. All right. Just to continue from where Sani was saying, I think increasingly we have been living in the virtual world, and I think one of the key challenges is going to be that um, a hundred percent virtual world is not going to be sustainable, um, and mainly I think uh, due to the mental health. Uh, and how that's impacting people. So one of the challenges that I see as we start moving towards a hybrid work working model is how do leaders distinguish um, managing teams and communicating uh, between teams that are still continuing to live in the virtual world and teams that have transitioned into the real world. I think what, that's one of the key challenges I think we will see in the post-pandemic stage. Yeah, I, I would endorse that, uh, that point and, and uh, um, make a couple of others. So, um, first of all, uh, you know, in, in my role as uh, um, on a diplomatic posting, the, um, we're acutely conscious that uh, people around the post network, the New Zealand post network, are operating in very different and, and sometimes very, very challenging uh, situations during the, the pandemic. So I would endorse, first of all, uh, the, uh, uh, the increase in focus on mental health uh, and well-being, And that's something our organization as a foreign affairs ministry has, uh, um, has really focused on and increased our in-house uh, capability to, uh, to try and, and provide uh, support across the globe. The second point uh, I think is, um, is equally valid. We've been... Uh, maintaining connections uh, using existing relationship capital. Um, and particularly when that, that comes to international um, relations and, and relationships, that can only take you so far. Um, so uh, at some point we will need to uh, relearn how to, how to connect in person physically, uh, um, as opposed to this, uh, this reliance on, on a, uh, a virtual world. And I'm well aware that, uh, particularly in the private sector, uh, sometimes hires have been made, um, uh, managers have, have hired people they've never yet met. Uh, and that's, that's a huge challenge to, to build a, um, a team spirit. Johan? 
just a very interesting thing for us in the world of engineering and uh, technology uh, is that we've uh, traditionally had people that service the equipment um, you know and at customer sites to travel to these sites to do the work and when we couldn't do this a lot of innovation and uh, different thinking happened and a lot of this work is now done remotely with using all kinds of uh, a, a, ar and vr technology and that's I think a, a profound change because many people were excluded from these jobs because they couldn't travel regularly and go to a remote site in Indonesia. But today we can engage the best brains with the biggest opportunities and the best problems wherever they are uh, through using technology. And I think that's a permanent change that we'll see in our industry. Hey, can I, can I add one more? Now that I've listened to a few of the speakers say, you know, uh, they are, they are, they are uh, experience and what they are ex uh, seeing. I, I think one thing that we are seeing a lot of change and is a positive change is the degree of appreciation, uh, especially for colleagues who, who survived through the pandemic and as well as those, um, you know, services, essential services that in the past we may have taken for granted. So I, I thought that was a very nice positive change in terms of the deeper appreciation of different groups of people like you know, the medical health, like the, um, uh, the supply chain business, you know, the, the, the grab or the delivery, you know, delivery um, people. I, I, I thought that was a really nice change, you know, uh, for post pandemic situation. Yes, I agree, Tani. I, I was about to say the same thing. I'm so glad to, to hear from all of you because from all the conversation, I can hear, you know, a very united theme, which is compassion. Because I feel like, okay, you know, traditionally business will talk about bottom line, okay, this quarter we need to meet the KPI, but no, it's all about compassion, mental wellness, and how we go to communicate to our employees internally, and of course externally to our stakeholders as well. So it's wonderful to hear. And as the workforce panelists becomes more remote and distributed, how can all workers benefit from this, especially for women? I can take that. Um, so I think it sort of continues from the first question, uh, Sabrina, right? Um, in software engineering and engineering teams, um, it's often heard that you can practice agility in software development. And one of the prerequisites for that is co-location of teams. And I think if there's one thing that COVID has taught us is that it's sort of dispelled all of these myths, right? Um, with all of these digital collaboration tools today, we are able to stitch these virtual teams together. Um, notwithstanding the tax implication, I think we will see the emergence of work from anywhere model to an extent. And what this does to organizations and employees alike is it opens up opportunity that would not have existed uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, so it gives us access to a global and diverse talent pool. Particularly for women, what this means is it allows them to return to work or even remain in work because flexibility has always been one of the, uh, one of the needs. I wouldn't say particularly for women, but, but to everyone, uh, but more so uh, for women who, who don different hats um, in their life, right? So I think this offers them that flexibility. And the second thing I, I also feel is that um, not particularly related to remote working, but I do believe that post pandemic, there's going to be a need for a very new kind of leadership. Um, a leadership that is very high in what I call the decency quotient, right? It's a kind of leadership that people will look towards in times of uncertainty, risk, uh, to bring about that hope. Now, if you look at um, countries that did well uh, when the pandemic onset, you will see that some of these were actually led by women, right? And I do believe that women have this characteristic and this innate ability to build to bring that empathetic leadership to the table. So I do think that women can thrive in the post-pandemic world and take on these kind of leadership positions. You know, I'm yes, gonna uh, add on to uh, Chana's uh, comment. You know, I, I represent the logistics industry, right? And, and you, we all know it's a hard and, and, and challenging, um, you know, almost 24 seven business. And uh, for women to, to work in this environment sometimes can be challenging because of the timing, because of the, you know, the, the heavy lifting physically, you know, that is required. 
So as I see that as we are getting into more um, advanced technology space, and that's where women could benefit tremendously because no longer we require people with huge physical physique, you know, uh, to, to get the work done. We can use technology to elevate those work for us. So I, I saw that as one of the ways that women could benefit from te technological advancement. And Her Excellency, would you like to contribute? Because obviously um, the Prime Minister of New Zealand did a wonderful job during the pandemic last year. Um, yes, uh, um, most definitely. And uh, I, I think uh, I really wanted to pick up on that, that point from uh, Atana, that uh, a new kind of leadership uh, is uh, becoming important. You know, back in the past, I think, because uh, um, I'm old enough to remember these things, back in the past, uh, when, um, you know, the first wave of feminism came through, I think there was a feeling that women needed to emulate men to succeed in business. They needed to be, you know, um, as uh, a kind of assertive, aggressive, whatever it might, might be, um, uh, to uh, uh, to kind of compete in the cut and thrust of the, the business world. Um, I think that over time, what's been really important is, and has now really coming into its own is uh, the, um, the success of, of authenticity um, in, in leadership. And that, that's, uh, I think that, that compassion theme you picked up earlier, um, the empathy, the ability to empathize um, has been hugely important. And those qualities um, have really um, resonated well uh, and allowed leaders uh, in this pandemic, I think, to communicate effectively um, with citizens, with the public, uh, and to uh, demonstrate, you know, in, in our own case, the, the Prime Minister demonstrated very closely and clearly that she was going through this, sharing the um, experiences of lockdowns and all the rest of it um, with a, um, a small child, uh, and, and doing so um, in ways that the, uh, the rest of the population could relate to and understand. Um, so that, that ability to communicate very clearly, very consistently, um, and to uh, we, you know, rely on science, all the rest of it, uh, I think we're, we're part of, of um, uh, you know, I'm not gonna generalize, but certainly in her case, her leadership qualities as a woman. Johan, you have anything to, to add on? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think all the panelists, what I hear is very positive and the future is really bright for women. There's a lot more opportunities in the job market. And as long as you have the skill set, a lot of organizations will love to have you. And then the other thing will be, I, it, it sounds like to me there's this new rising of feminine energy. So we're talking about authenticity, compassion, empathy this is all feminine energy so there's it's there's a lot there's a lot of recognition during the COVID and um I feel like leader, leaders with these type of leadership uh, quality will be rewarded and will be uh, appreciated and even during and post pandemic as well and uh, panelists companies right now are rapidly transforming um using automations and digitalization to accelerate growth post pandemic what skills will be needed to remain competitive in the new global job market? Yeah, I can take that one, Sabrina, for a start, just to open it. And just to confirm that, I mean, automation and digitalization has been a topic for quite some time, but it is rapidly accelerating um, post-COVID and or even during COVID. I mean, one interesting data point is we have had a significant growth in the sale of industrial robots during the COVID pandemic. Um, not in the automotive sector, but in all other sectors. So, and in, just one indicator of how technology is being adapted to make supply chains more robust and to enable this working from remote and, and just different ways of collaborating and working together as we've heard. And um, in all of this, I mean, it's just highlighted to me even more that people are truly our greatest asset. Technology on its own can't solve a problem, can't fix any problem. It's when human ingenuity 
meets the tools of technology and is applied to solve a problem or make something more sustainable or make something more beautiful, that's when the music happens. So skills is, is key. And to think about, well, what does this new world look like and what do we need to thrive and survive? And I would say the first one for me is a general competence with technology. Not everybody needs that. My mom and dad needs it. My children, I mean, you need to know your way around technology. And um, firstly, for your personal effectiveness. And secondly, um, so that in your job, in your leadership position, or whatever, you can understand what is available through technology. What are the opportunities that are available to you? I think there's a big challenge separating hype from what really makes a difference because, you know, with anything that's growing as rapidly as, as the moment, there's some things that are useful and some that are not so useful. Um, so technology, um, I would say a second um, uh, data set is around data. I think we've just begun, in, especially in industry, factories, industrial um, processes, we've just begun to adopt uh, you know, analysis of data and um, screening data and making things visible and understanding where the real opportunities lie to improve things and make them better and to be more effective. So any skill set around data and analytics, um, artificial intelligence, all of those topics that deal and work with data. And another general skill is just learning agility. You know, the, the, this is not a once-off change, but it's a new pace of change. So we see continuous waves of new technology coming and new ways of working. So learning agility, I think, is a, a very important trait. And that's going to be key to remain innovative, to stay um, ahead of the curve, uh, not to be forced to adopt technology, but to adopt technology being proactive, um, you know, and, 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 and really thriving. And I would say the last one, as a general category of skills, is I can see domain expertise are going to become more and more critical because you can only do so much sitting remotely from where the real action happens, where the customers are, where the factory is, where the motors are turning, where the industrial robot is working. And increasingly, we're going to be needing people who's actually been there, who understand how these processes and systems work. Um, so we need to continue to create those opportunities, even though we are engaging many more through the virtual world and, and online. So just that as an introduction. Thank you. Achana, you want to? I, I couldn't agree more uh, with Johanna, particularly with the continuous learning and the need to upskill yourself um, to become that future ready workforce. I think the saying that you need to learn and learn and relearn continuously applies even more so, I think, in the post pandemic world. And I think at DBS, we recognize this. And there's a lot of investment in sort of um, investing in the employee journey um, and allowing people to upskill themselves um, and, and keep, keep themselves relevant as the environment continues to change is something that we are seeing significantly. Um, could I just add that uh, um, it's been very clear that the uh, digitalization theme has, uh, um, has been a, a kind of a worldwide phenomenon, I think. Um, and put in a small plug uh, for the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, the DEPA, uh, that New Zealand, Singapore and Chile managed to conclude, uh, have signed, uh, and uh, it's now entered into force uh, for New Zealand and Singapore. Um, uh, and, and all that uh, uh, happened over the course of last year. So it was um, a virtual signing ceremony, which was um, nicely appropriate given the subject matter. So uh, I think what, what we're seeing and what the, the, the deeper agreement is, is trying to uh, facilitate is uh, the digital economy in the wider sense. So not only uh, the, the kind of pure uh, digital um, services and, and uh, um, uh, businesses, but equally the digital components of traditional um, goods and, and services being uh, extra exchanged via um, digital means. Um, and I think uh, there have been, we've seen examples of lots of opportunities that, that women and others have, have taken advantage of during the course of the pandemic, um, kind of looking at, uh, you know, picking up those new skills or looking at new business opportunities that they could do based from home um, and uh, um, using uh, digital technology to uh, market to uh, deliver uh, whatever it, it is they've been creating 
um, uh, or making uh, uh, from their home-based uh, uh, businesses. So yeah, um, the, the, the deeper we hope um, uh, and think looks at both facilitating digital trade um, whether that's e-invoicing or um, digital identities or AI or whatever it might be, um, but also looking at the um, other side, and there was an earlier comment about um, cybersecurity, um, looking at, at uh, the, the privacy and, and security side of the equation as well to find that balance between the two. Jenny, anything to add on? Well, um, you know, I want to touch on the softer side and a few economies here in Asia, especially uh, we, are, we are aging economy, right? Um, so to ask the, um, the older workforce to embrace technology can be daunting. It can be quite scary. So I would say that it takes upon us, you know, um, those of us who are in leadership position um, to reach out and, and to create that safe environment and to let them try and, and find ways to communicate, to elevate that, that concern, that fear, you know, that, that unknown. So um, it's not really a skill, but I'm just saying that, you know, in terms of the, the responsibility to bring people on board uh, is, is equally critical and important. Yeah, mm, I agree. And um, just to sum it up, all the what all the panelists just share, I think there's two main areas. So in terms of the hard technical skills, I think there are a few areas that you know all the participants choose to take a look will be artificial intelligence, uh, data, especially data analytics, um, and also cybersecurity. And for the softer side, the soft skills that we should have to remain competitive uh, for the future of work will be learning agility. So during the entire conversation, you hear a lot of learn and learn, relearn. So I think for all of us to remain competitive in the future, we have to have the agility to learn, to unlearn and relearn. Maybe just one last comment on that is, I mean, when I look around, I think one of the scarcest skills today is leadership and leadership um, that, care, that can care for people in these rapidly changing environment and often working remotely. So. I think we need to really, really make sure we continue to develop leaders with the right kind of skills that truly care for people, that have a good business sense, and that um, that because uh, for me a lot uh, hangs on the quality of leadership in our companies, in our society at large. I'm so glad to hear, and it just out of my curiosity, and I would love to ask all of you as well because you are definitely the leader of your own organization. You know, during the pandemic, including myself, it's all about my team, all about my employees. And how do you all self-love and self-care during that time? I think, uh, I think, Sabrina, one of the key challenges is, I think, is, has been that, right? Um, defining those boundaries. When, when work is at home, it is increasingly challenging. Um, I personally found that once in Singapore, we entered the phase two, um, I found it a bit easier to get back into work and start spending a, a portion of the week in the office. Um, like I said earlier, right, you simply cannot replace the importance, the warmth that that physical interaction brings between people. For me, that was a, a significant change uh, from the first six months that I went through working from home. Um, so I think for me, that has been very important. Um, getting back into the office has been a, a significant shift for me. Um, from, from my perspective, uh, my, my family is all back in New Zealand, um, so uh, that was particularly challenging last year um, during the, uh, the, the circuit breaker um, to, to um, be, be kind of coping alone. Um, and it, it gave me, um, I think, the whole experience last year gave me um, a lot of appreciation, much more direct appreciation for the different living uh, and home life circumstances um, of not only myself, but uh, also everyone in, in my team. Um, and uh, we've found that uh, some people have really relished the opportunity to work from home. Um, for other people, um, 
it's it's been uh, a bit of a nightmare. Uh, whether that's because of young children uh, taking up lots of space, um, you know, two partners both trying to uh, to work within a, um, a confined space, um, or uh, um, just yeah, not 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 having a um, a great deal of of room to uh, or, or the facilities to to do it. So um, uh, it's been I, I think it's been really good to have mixed. Uh, a little bit of time in the office, a little bit of time at home. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's now working out very well for pretty well everybody in, in our team. Uh, they, you know, we're, we're, um, we've got the connection time, but we've equally got the, the time uh, to um, focus uh, and, you know, do the, the, the hard thinking type work. Uh, in a home environment with often fewer distractions. Um, I'll share. Um, you know, I'm a HR person, not just a HR person for any company, but for an essential service company and going through pandemic is really no fun. Um, well, I, I found myself uh, working extremely long hours uh, working from home. Um, because you can think about, you know, we have, I have to handle all kinds of people issues. Um, for example, people who said, look, I have a autistic, you know, family member at home. I can't work from home. So what do I do? And yet at the same time, I can't go back to the office, you know, and then I've got very differing um, circumstances coming to me, work challenges, contingencies. Um, it was very draining, I must tell you, very draining. But uh, what I've learned is, um, discipline <laughs> really it's like a different level of discipline where uh li literally i have to cut myself you know at certain time to just space out you know uh, the me time it's difficult to do sometimes you know i have to do it like uh only i can only afford to do it once a week if not once every two weeks that's not enough um and it comes to a point where you know if i don't make a discipline you know a, a habit to do so uh, I myself will go downhill mentally as well. So, <laughs> so I, I think, you know, uh, for all of us, um, uh, Achana talk about balance. I think it's important for us to, to know where to find that balance and also to reach out to people around us to speak. Many a times I would just call people who understand my situation and just, you know, download. And I need that because of the, the, the nature of my, my work and my environment. So, um, so always reach out, you know, don't feel that we are alone. I can just add that, uh, I mean, taking care of yourself is taking care of your team because you cannot help your team and you can't lead well if you're not in a good place. So I think uh, making sure you're physically in good shape, sleep well, eat well, get exercise is important to me and something that I just uh, embraced through the, this period, but also spiritually, making sure that you're in a good place and um, paying attention to that. And I, the second comment is just, I appreciate my team more than ever. It's this mindset that you, it's all up to you, you're alone, it's all, I mean, that is just such a, a wrong thinking. And uh, you've got a team and we carried each other through this. And I think we're stronger together as a team than ever. So I think that's one thing that, uh, you know, they say, don't ever waste the crisis. And I really experienced that, you know, this is gelled as a team and I, I'm so grateful for the people that I could work with and on the days that I were off and that I could be honest about it and someone else carried the flag and, and so we help each other through this. So. Yeah, and I completely agree. And there's a saying, right, when the plane is going down, you, you need to make sure that you have the oxygen mask so that you can save everyone else around you. So it's very important to self-care and self-love. So panelists, it's an unfortunate fact that women globally represent less than 20% of workers in technology and STEM related jobs. What can be done to encourage more women in these sectors? Achana, you want to start first? Sure, sure. I think, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's really an unfortunate fact as you rightly put it, right? Um, and I, I do believe that um, if you take a step back, right, the, the cause for this, women go through life stages. We know that. And, and we make uh, conscious choices and decisions and prioritize between our personal and, and professional priorities at various stages. And people do this very differently, right? Um, what's, what I'm seeing increasingly happen, and I see this when I interview women, is that women are consciously choosing organizations that recognize this fact 
right? Um, and they offer that flexibility. They level the playing field for them, right? And they make a conscious effort to recruit women into the ranks. So it's no longer about women, you know, um, I've heard often being told, you have to choose a partner who supports your career aspirations. It's not just about that, right? You also want to choose an organization that supports your aspirations, personally and professionally. So at DBS, one of the things um, we've done, we've done significantly uh, well over the last few years in doing this, I must say, um, what we did was this year for International Women's Day, we were part of the SG Women in Tech IMDA company pledge, where we pledged very consciously to move the needle in this regard. Um, in 2019, we launched the DBS Hack to Hire Her. It's a flagship event. Uh, that was specially curated to attract women talent, right? And what we saw with that, and more recently, the DBS Women in Tech, which was a purely women-focused uh, hiring, what we saw is that when organizations make this conscious effort to attract women, uh, you do see that shift happening. So to give you an example, right, we had over 500 women technologists apply. And then you hear that there are no women in technology, but there are, it's just how you go and reach out to them. If you keep fishing in the same pond, you're not going to get it, right? So I think that's what we realized um, in uh, sort of in the recruitment uh, space. Um, aside to this, uh, from a policy perspective, DBS recently also launched the job sharing, right? And what that allows is it allows women who are perhaps trying to make a return to work and want that flexibility. So it's a part-time job sharing where uh, a single role is shared by two people. So it allows the flexibility to women who want to return to work, uh, but perhaps not full-time yet. And they just want to return part-time to begin with. So I think these are some of the things that we are seeing within DBS that is sort of helping us move the needle in that, in that regard. Yes, I also want to quickly add on to uh, DBS is also one of our progressive employers on Half the Sky, and they are hiring aggressively for female talent. It's a topic I'm passionate about and uh, would love to see more women talent coming into the, especially the industrial space. And I think we've got a huge task to systematically remove all the barriers and mindset issues that there are with men and women around this sector. You know, this mindset that it's a car mechanic kind of business still lingers around, you know, and the picture and the image of that whole, the whole industry, we have to change that. And uh, there's no time such as now. We really have an opportunity to accelerate that. And I think it starts with how we portray ourselves as technology and industrial companies in, in the market. You know, what, how do we come across? What does our advertisements look like? How do we post jobs? What do the job descriptions look like? How does it read? Um, who writes them? You know, so there's a whole lot of things that you have to systematically and consistently do, I think, to, to drive this change. And I, I personally believe in, you know, I mean, for me, I don't appoint anybody or promote anybody if I don't have a female in my shortlist. So this the team knows that that's where we go. Because I have seen this consistently is when I get a critical mass of female leadership in the company, it changes the network that we have access to. And suddenly it, there's role models, there's, the access opens. And I have such a good example. I mean, for uh, in the years that I've, I've been here in Singapore, our highest performing, most consistently profitable business is our substations business, which is typically a very male dominated business. In this particular business, because of great leadership from a man that's, that's gone before, um, he's a point, the whole team, all of the project managers were female, all of them, and quite a few of the engineers. And that was a great example and, and circled out to several other parts of our business. So I think we need those examples and yeah, just uh, we have a great opportunity to make a difference and to see more young women um, being attracted to you know, STEM jobs we the and we will never succeed if we only use half of our population. Johan, I think uh, the internet connection was just breaking up a little bit. Would you mind repeating uh, the past twenty seconds, perhaps? 
I'm not sure where you lost me, but I, I just said that there is an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, a lot of industrial growth, national economic growth, depends on the industrial sector growing and thriving. And we will never be able to thrive if we only access half the talent that's available. So it's, it's important. It's really of national importance to me that we engage all talent. Thank you. You know, let me add on also that, you know, um, it's not just, well, we have to look at both the demand and the supply side of the equation. So the demand side, obviously, we have work to do, right, in terms of how we should position women in the different organizations. Um, but when I look at the supply side, uh, I do see that the future will hold more than 20% you know, that, that we are seeing today because the educational system that, at least from what I've seen, uh, are doing a great job in allowing and, and educating more females um, in, in the technical space. Um, for example, my daughter, you know, she's given the opportunity to go for robotics. She's quite young, she's not very old. Um, so I thought, wow, that's fantastic, you know. Um, and I think we also need to consider not just the formal education, but the informal uh, educational piece as well. I've come across one great um, LinkedIn contact where uh, this individual is a children's author. He writes uh, storybooks, uh, uh, you know, for children, and he's got narratives and all that. And he told me that, you know, it's important, and his mission is really to create gender equality in, in the books that he writes, um, not just about princess for females and all, but you know, how can girls stand up for themselves? How can girls look at things from a different perspective and tackle issues you know, in his storyline? So I thought those are excellent um, informal education that we can impart to you know, many people to start from young that, hey, it's gender equality we're talking about. Anyone can go for any job. I agree. And um, Kenny, just a, just a quick sharing. So last night I was speaking at the National, uh, National University of Singapore. So I spoke to a lot of the young graduates, females, all of them are females. And they're very bright. They're very digital savvy. They, they know what they need, um, you know, to, to be competitive in the workforce. So they know they need to have data analytics skills. They know about AI, cybersecurity. And of course, some of them also share with me when they were uh, doing internships in some of the male dominated industry, the treatment that they get, the growth culture that they they experience. And they did tell me they, they spoke they spoke up to the HR, which uh, you know, from my surprise, because it, it just how progressive they are and they're not afraid. When they see something is wrong, they will they will voice out. And I, I think that's great. The future is bright when, when I spoke to all these students. I think for the professional women, um, as Achana shared just previously, you know, the learning, unlearn and relearn is so important for the uh, women who are currently in the workforce. If you want to stay competitive, you have to upskill yourself right now. And Her Excellency, is there anything to add on? Um, I don't have a great deal to add, um, except that the, the two points that are really, uh, um, I think, are, are super important, because the thing is, this is a global problem. Um, everywhere, uh, there seemed to be this, this disparity and, and uh, um, you know, tiny percentage uh, of women uh, taking STEM subjects. Uh, and then, even if they do, following through from uh, education uh, into the workforce and, and pursuing it there. Um, so I think, I think the two points that are super important are starting young, absolutely. Um, and, and thinking about this uh, from a very early uh, point, I've been thinking during school education, but uh, I'm delighted to, to hear the thought that, that maybe uh, even earlier, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of the kinds of literature uh, that, that need to be good stories, but, uh, but nonetheless uh, um, it engage uh, young girls when they're very, very tiny. The other thing, uh, I think Johan's point about um, how these roles are portrayed um, is, uh, again, super important. You know, if you think about lawyers, for example, where, uh, you know, uh, at least half um, of those going through a law degree in, in New Zealand, and I'm sure elsewhere, are, are, are women. Um, very few people end up being 
lawyers in the pure sense you know, um, uh, representing people in court, whether as barristers or solicitors. People use the law degree as an opportunity to um, explore uh, career choices in, in a much, much broader sense. And I think we need to start thinking about and promoting the STEM subjects in a very similar way, that it opens the doors um, for uh, um, career choices that are, um, uh, extend well beyond the, um, as Johan said, the, the kind of car mechanic, uh, <laughs> a kind of um, uh, stereotypical image we might have. I agree, Her Excellencies, and thank you for, for sharing. So um, it has been said that at the current rate of change, the gender gap and economic participation and opportunity won't close for another 257 years. What can organizations and male airlines do so we all don't have to wait that long? Johan, you want to go first? Um, well, I'm very hopeful that we're not going to wait that long. It cannot be. And uh, I see, I really do see a groundswell and momentum building, at least in the world that I live in, um, where more and more people taking this topic very seriously and diligently working at ensuring that we have a better outcome um, and, and building momentum, accelerating. Um, when it comes to male allies, um, I think, wow, you know, for me, I am um, a strong believer in leading by example. Um, we need men who consistently every day do the right thing, every day speak up when there is inappropriate comments or, uh, you know, um, where mindsets reflect kind of bias thinking. Um, we meet, uh, that to me is much more impress impressive than these impressive ones offs that go posted all over LinkedIn and Instagram and everywhere. And I see a little bit of that happening and that, that starts to brand what a male ally is like. Is someone, you know, who on International Women's Day makes a very profound post, but that's not it. It's the every day, every meeting, What's the positions we're taking? Who are we advocating for? Who are we supporting? How are we un systematically dismantling an unconscious and conscious bias in the workplace? And I admire men who do that. Um, men is very important with this because just the fact is, especially in STEM, that most of the leadership positions are occupied by men. And leadership is about caring for people and it is about consistently making the best decisions you can in an unbiased way. So for me, male allies starts with a journey of self-awareness. You've got to get to deal with this thing by yourself and firstly acknowledge that you have been, if you are a man, you have benefited from this. And how are you now going to use the situation you find yourself in to make sure the world is more fair and more free going forward? You know, so I think it has to, if you haven't gone through that journey and you haven't understood the bias that you carry, you, you can forget about being a male ally. In a, in a proper sense of it. I think a second thing for me is just listening. You know, the idea that we can fix this problem, that's not the point, you know? So listen, put yourself in someone else's shoes and understand where the mindset or where the problem comes from. And then let's see how we can all work together. And I would say my last comment is just uh, really important that we create a movement that there's, you know, one family at a time, one workplace at a time, one country at a time, hopefully, that builds momentum and that there is a real groundswell that biased decision-making is unacceptable and we find and figure out all the ways in which bias represents itself in wherever we find ourselves in society at large. Yes. Achana? I, I, I really uh, like the point that uh, Johan made about the bias, right? So it's one thing to tackle challenges that are in your face. It's, um, it's almost impossible to tackle challenges that you can't really see for yourself that you may be exhibiting or someone else could be exhibiting, right? So I think everything starts with awareness um, for organizations, right? You have to build that awareness that there is unconscious bias and you have to have a proper mechanism to deal with that, right? So at DBS, we launched um, a formal unconscious bias learning last year and we're taking that up a notch this year to sort of pervade that through the organizations and allow uh, people at all levels and particularly leaders and managers of people um, 
to sort of unlearn some of these behaviors um, that could otherwise influence their decisions, be that with hiring or promotions or even allocation of work. Johan earlier alluded to how you stereotype certain roles, right? You have this mindset, oh, you're a project manager, so maybe a woman would fit there. So these are all, these are not done intentionally, uh, I'd like to believe, but it's an unconscious bias, right? So building that awareness, having formal trainings are something that organizations must do. And the second thing um, which uh, Tani alluded to earlier is um, the pipeline problem. It does exist. And if corporates do not invest in that, I think that 200 plus years may well become a reality, right? Because you're going to start depleting. Like any other natural resource, it is going to deplete if you do not find a way to put that back into the system. So working at the grassroots level, I think, is of paramount importance. So uh, prior to the pandemic, we kicked off the, the coding day for girls um, in DBS, and we partner with uh, the MOE schools here, where we taught primary six girls um, in the age group of 10 to 11 how to think um, about design thinking, programming, mobile app development. So to sort of kindle that interest, right? And, and this year, we're partnering with organizations uh, like United Women Singapore to take the Girls to Pioneer program uh, to the next level as well. So I think we need to do our part at, um, at that. In terms of male allies, I think that's an interesting question, right? I believe that on an average in, in STEM-related industries, um, you have about 20, give or take, 20%, 22% women at any given point in time. Um, so if nearly 80% of that population is men, and if they are not part of the solution, I don't think you're solving the problem. That 20% is not going to solve the problem, okay? So that 80% has to join hands. So I think that's where it's very important. And there is this myth, and I see this uh, many times when you have women in tech chapters, um, men have this trepidation, oh, it's women in tech, do I play a role at all? And I say, you absolutely do play a role. Um, so one of the things we did, and I think um, when Johan mentioned that you need to have a call to action, you need to have a movement. I think that's what we created in DBS last year. We launched what is called the Project Equali, right? And it stemmed from gender equality and having allies. So we called it Project Equali. And that was to sort of bring in more allies, both men and women. Uh, to the table and now we have over 130 allies across the organizations who in their own way little or big in an everyday uh, manner are contributing to this cause so i think these are some of the things that i have seen and i think organizations can adopt um, to sort of um, reduce that 200 plus years gap that we otherwise will perhaps see i agree um could, uh, I could add a, um, a few things there. So, um, and because I think uh, the, the points that have been made are, are already are completely relevant. Uh, from the point of view of our own Ministry uh, Foreign Affairs and, and Trade in, in New Zealand, um, we uh, have um, developed and, and rolled out a diversity and inclusion uh, strategy. Um, and uh, um, there is a, a, a male senior member of the senior leadership team who is uh, um, the champion uh, for that particular strategy. We have made it a requirement for uh, any uh, of our managers who are running hiring panels to take uh, to, to hire into new positions uh, to go through unconscious bias training. Because uh, absolutely uh, agree, we all have unconscious bias of one sort or another and being aware of, of what that is and, and how to kind of deal with it, manage it is, is hugely important. Um, I think uh, the other things I wanted to add were the, the huge importance of family friendly policies within workplaces. Um, and uh, um, part of that is May, be, being really clear about de, we're setting up systems that would destigmatize men um, taking, for, for example, taking leave uh, for family reasons. Uh, at the moment, uh, even if the policies are there, uh, in some parts of the world and, and in some uh, organizations, men feel reticent that it'll somehow, you know, count against them if they take the opportunity of, of um, paternity leave, even if it's, if, if it's available to them, just as an example. Um, role models 
um, I, I think are, are hugely important. I mean, this is just a tiny example, but uh, the, the speaker in New Zealand's parliament, um, who is a man, uh, there was an image or a, a short video that went viral um, on the internet when he uh, took one of the MP's young babies into his arms as he was sitting on in the speaker's chair and nursed the baby. So he fed the baby the bottle while he was running parliament and, and calling for order and, and uh, all, all the rest of it. Um, and it was just such a lovely image and a reminder um, that uh, these roles and responsibilities can and should be um, equally shared and that workplaces have a responsibility to put in place family friendly policies uh, that in this case um, enabled uh, um, a young child, uh, a baby to be brought into the House of Parliament to uh, um, you know, ensure that its, its parents could, could continue their job. Um, and I think the last thing is uh, to um, get beyond the mindset that there are not enough capable women to um, fulfill board roles or senior leadership roles or, or whatever. But of course, we'd love to, um, but there aren't enough women there to, uh, you know, sort of do the job. We've got to just get beyond that. And part of doing that, I think, is, is building up systems, not only of mentors, but also sponsors. And I, I do think that sponsorship question is one that we've perhaps overlooked a little bit. And that is um, having uh, others uh, who are already in senior leadership positions, um, endorsing skills, encouraging women to put themselves forward for role, roles and speaking up um, on their behalf uh, to, uh, to make sure they, they get those opportunities. So I think those are some, um, you know, tactics that could work. So uh, I'll just add a little bit more comment, very, very good uh, um, engagement already. And I can't agree more with Her Excellency's comment that there are plenty of capable women out there. I'm just gonna share a little bit about UPS, the company that I work for and, and I manage the APEC region. Right now, the, the, the top leadership for the APEC region uh, is about 40% female, you know, occupying those uh, vice president's positions. And if I look at um, positions where we require employees to manage others, meaning we call them as supervisors and above, management employees, uh, we are uh, as right now 43% female uh, sitting in those positions. I mean, coming from a logistics industry, I thought this is fabulous. Um, how did we get here? Well, um, it's not overnight for sure. So those uh, sharings that we have heard, uh, what UPS has done, and I believe many organizations have already adopted those. You know, for example, ensuring that we look at female candidates when we talk about uh, succession planning uh, in the meetings, um, making sure that all candidates that are in the pipeline, we have good representation there as well. In fact, if you ask me, I think my company may have taken a little bit too much where now I'm actually managing a situation where uh, a senior leader wanted to put females there because there isn't enough and knowing that some of them may not qualify. So from a HR standpoint, we actually have to say, wait, hang on, you know, we want to put qualified people and people who could be role model, uh, I, I know, uh, figures there so that we can encourage more to come forward. So I think, you know, it's important for us to do that balance at the same time. Um, in addition to all the policies and all the tactics that we, we spoke earlier. Hmm. Agree, Kenny. Thank you so much. Um, so panelists, many companies are trying to do the right thing, but many of the issues affecting women are deeply societal. How can we increase the level of female participants in politics so that they can legislate for greater change? Um, Sabrina, I, I think that's, uh, that's probably one I should kick off on. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, um, political leadership and the, the fact that uh, um, New Zealand is one of the countries uh, during the COVID pandemic uh, that has uh, um, a female leader, uh, our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Now, interestingly, this is not the first time we've had uh, a number of women in key political leadership roles within New Zealand. 
So 20 years ago, um, we had uh, um, our first elected female prime minister, Helen Clark. Um, we had a, a, a woman attorney, uh, sorry, attorney general, governor general, and uh, the chief executive of our biggest publicly listed company, all at the, the same time. Um, now, uh, things sort of, you know, changed a, a, a little bit after that. And a generation le uh, later, we're uh, again in a position with a, uh, a woman prime minister, leader of the opposition as a woman, the governor general, our foreign affairs minister, and a whole host of others. Um, what I think has, has been important uh, um, in that is that um, girls have seen what is possible. Um, and uh, our Prime Minister, uh, um, Ardern, has said very clearly that she was inspired by um, seeing Helen Clark um, as uh, the country's Prime Minister um, in her, you know, uh, formative years, um, uh, 20 years earlier. Um, uh, I, I said earlier the, uh, the idea of sponsorship, that encouragement to give it a go and, and endorsing um, skills or, or abilities or potential. We know that women uh, are um, less likely to feel super confident um, or even overconfident um, of their skills and abilities. So, so having that, that uh, encouragement to put themselves forward, I, I think has really been important. Um, and uh, um, more recently, uh, um, as we said earlier, that recognition that female leadership qualities uh, um, are likely to serve countries well um, in a crisis. And, and our own Prime Minister has faced not only the pandemic, but also uh, uh, terrorism incidents, the significant terrorism incident, um, volcano, uh, which uh, um, was hugely devastating and killed a number of people. Um, and of course, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic in the last year. So um, uh, I think that having that, that clear demonstration um, that uh, um, authenticity in, in leadership resonates well with the public um, and brings uh, a country along in behind in a, in a time of crisis, I, I think has been hugely important. The question for me, um, is, and, and, and I really hope, that we don't have to wait another 20 years um, for uh, the, the confluence of, of women in um, these, you know, really important political, political leadership roles to, to happen again. Hopefully, um, having had that demonstration effect um, on at least two occasions, we can just now see it as the new normal and uh, um, have it continue. Thank you, Her Excellencies. And we are reaching to our final part of our panel, and we're focusing more on how we can all thrive in the new world of work. So the theme of the IWD this year is Choose to Challenge. What would you ask us all to challenge as we try to build a fairer and more just world? Panelists? I can go first. I think what I would ask um, and this is what I chose to challenge myself, is uh, anything that places a limiting belief on uh, any individual and particularly women. I think if we can summarize everything that we spoke about, I think um, we all have immense potential. Uh, women do too. There is no role that a woman could not do. Um, and there are ample examples to show that. So, and the pandemic has shown us that, that um, we can learn and thrive and, um, overcome any adversity. So I think any, any mindset that puts a limiting belief is what I would choose to challenge and I would urge everyone to challenge that. I would agree with that. Um, let's no longer believe in a glass ceiling. It doesn't exist. I refuse to accept it exists. Yeah, for me, I, I, I would say, you know, back to the word listen, because biasness, although we all know about it, but when it's put in front of us, when the biasness is in front of us, it's very hard to accept it. It's very hard to say that I have certain degree of biasness. So I would say, you know, I would challenge each one of us, especially those in leadership, to listen and to be willing to just put off any preconception and also at the same time, challenge women to speak up. The, the, the mindset of curiosity to me is very powerful.
because when we are curious, anything can, is possible. I would say um, something that I choose to challenge is this uh, mindset that is very prevalent with men is that they lose out when women succeed. And this is not a zero sum game. I am absolutely convinced of this. We all win, we all gain when the best talent is consistently and systematically engaged. Uh, so that's what I choose to challenge. Thank you. And the last question of today will be what does thriving mean for employees in this new world of work? Maybe I'll, I'll go ahead. So to me, uh, for employees to, to thrive, uh, it's important to have clarity of mind and purpose. Um, because only with that, then we can then set the direction exactly where we want to go and then find ways to get there. And the ability to pivot, I love the word pivot, because it's not asking us to change completely. It's the ability to maneuver and be willing and, and, and open and agile enough to try new things. So, so I would say those three things, clarity of mind and purpose, discipline, and the pivoting. I would say, Sabrina, I think um, three things for me would be resilience. Um, you gotta have to build that resilience within you um, in the new world. Second, you have to set boundaries for which you need to prioritize relentlessly. So this art of prioritizing has to be there within people. And third would be the focus on uh, physical and mental health, which we may have ignored in the past, uh, but I think is of paramount importance in the new world. I would say for me to thrive, and thriving to me, the way what that looks like is when, not, when all of our employees arrive at the office or at, engage where they work, because it's not arriving at the office anymore, but engage where they work with all of who they are, with all their passion, all their enthusiasm, and you get this connection between what they're passionate about and what they're doing every day, and that, and that they feel valued, they can see that they're making a contribution, um, truly making this world a better place. So I mean, that to me is what thriving looks like. And when we've got a workplace where people are engaged, included, um, stretched, developed. Um, that's, that's what I look for, to see that happen. Making sure we can use flexible working to maximize uh, our engagement and productivity as individuals and as teams um, is hugely important. Um, Family-friendly policies, um, I, I have spoken about earlier. And equally, uh, I think, uh, for each of us to see a path to advancement, however you define advancement for yourself, whatever works best, um, because that may not necessarily mean, you know, climbing up a, um, uh, a particular ladder, um, but, but seeing that pathway forward and, and uh, um, being supported to achieve it. Thank you so much. I can't agree more. And a wonderful and very insightful sharing panelists. So we are going to move on to our Q&A session. We are slightly over time, so, but we'll take uh, several questions from the audience. And uh, audience, please put down your questions on the chat box and I'll read it out for you. So we already have our first question from AZ. So panelists, was there a mentor who told you something that made an impact to you that you shared to your own team? I don't know, uh, Sabrina, if I've had um, a, a mentor specifically. There have been uh, um, role models, I guess, who have um, inspired me. And I have been uh, a mentor to a number of um, other women. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, sorry, can you ask me the, the last bit again? I'm trying to remember what I no was going problem. to say. No problem. So the, the questions from Asi will be, was there a mentor who told you something that made an impact to you that you shared to your own team? 
or you may not share with your own team, but just something that really speaks to you and that become your motto in life as well. Yeah, ah, yes. The second part I was going to say was that this was not so much mentors, but getting 360 degree feedback. Um, while uh, that could be confronting at times and, and uh, you know, you sort of pull you up short, um, it, it's incredibly helpful to get that sense of how others perceive you um, and uh, to take that on board in how you then manage your relationships uh, with the team as a whole, but with individual team members as well. And learning how to um, communicate in, in two directions, your work preferences, what might be a kind of influencing you on a, on a good or a bad day, whatever it might be. Those sort of things I think have, have been really helpful. So maybe I'll go ahead next. Um, uh, I had, uh, I would call him a mentor and a sponsor at the same time, where um, there's one period of my life, I had a very uh, difficult pregnancy. Um, and to the point where uh, I can't work at all. And I was so fearful that I would lose my job because um, uh, the company I work for is very results driven, uh, no nonsense, and then everyone has to be like 100%. So you can think about, you know, to stay away from work is like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my job and what should I do? So uh, this manager of mine um, actually said, look, you don't worry, you, don't, you go, just take care of yourself and your, your, you know, your, your baby. Then, then I was pregnant and uh, let me handle the situation. You don't worry. My goodness, that was like, you know, a jackpot that I got. Um, I know it may sound like a common sense to, to many people, but uh, since then I learned to respect, you know, life cycle, be it men or women, and everyone has a time, you know, where he or she may require to handle personal situation. I think we just need to, you know, give people space and who knows a person may come back completely different and even have a lot more different level of respect and, 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 and be a much better employee. So, so that's something that I've learned tremendously from this person. I've had... Uh... A fortunate position that I've worked for several bosses and two particular ones where I was I knew that I was supported I knew that I was safe with them and that I was genuinely included in, in the team and, and what they did and you know I know what that makes me feel like and I know how that brought the best out of me and and that has permanently shaped the way I lead is to make sure that I'm doing the same for those that I lead, um, no matter where they come from, and you know, for all talent that, that I engage, and that everyone should experience that, because that is an incredibly liberating thing, when you know that you're supported, someone believes in you, and you're included. And the second role model for me is our chairman, Peter Fozer, um, he's a, was the global CEO of uh, Shell, and is active on Catalyst, and he just shared a little bit of his experience of you know bringing women into leadership positions he made the point for example that um it's you know if you've got two equally qualified persons one man and one woman for a job it's highly likely 90 percent of the case the man will say even if it's a stretch yes i'm up for it and only in 20 percent of the cases that happens for women and uh, that stuck in my mind and, and just the way he's worked that out in his career and where he's taken chances on people um, I've done the same, so that's that's been very inspiring to me. So I think um, two things that I want to share is um, something that I was going through um, earlier on in my career and, and maybe not uh, completely achieved it yet. So one of the things is when you build as a leader, you try to build high performing teams. Um, sometimes you tend to lose focus about what it is that you want out of the employee versus what the employee wants for himself or herself. And one of the things that my mentor taught me was trying to sort of balance that. And I think Johan would probably refer to this. Um, the passion that the employee has versus what the organization wants, you have to learn to how to connect that when you try to build a high-performing team. Um, what you want for that employee may not be what the employee wants for himself or herself. And you need to understand that difference. Um, that's one, one key advice which I 
which I got. And I, I find that tremendously useful when I learn to um, interact with people. The second thing is I've always struggled to, uh, to find work-life balance. And I've always believed that it's either the company or the role or the kind of job that I do. And very recently, I got told by a mentor and who said, Archana, it's not the company. It's not the job. It is you. Right. So people who, who have a certain disposition to how they tackle work, no matter where you put them, no matter what kind of role you put them, they will end up working 15 hours uh, a day. So it's about learning to prioritize and figuring out what really matters to you. And any job or any company or any role can give you that balance. So I think those are two pieces of advice which I find incredibly useful. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. We are slightly overrun. So I think um, I'm going to wrap the panel um, up right now. And again, thank you all so much for joining us today. And the, again, the diversity employers on our platform are hiring and they're committed to empower women to thrive within their organization. They provide flexible working arrangements, equal pay initiatives, return to work policies, leadership development program, pay parental leave, and many more. And their jobs are listed on our platform. Please go check them out. And we also uh, at Half the Sky have a lot of resources to share with you on our platform. So make sure you sign up on halfthesguyasia.com. It's completely free. And you also receive exclusive event invite, uh, invite like this one, job alerts, thought leadership content, and resources. So sharing is caring. Please share with your friends, family, or any woman you know who will be benefit from it. And again, thank you so much all for all the panelists, uh, Her Excellency, Achana, Tani, and Johan for your time today. Stay safe, everybody, and take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sabrina. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.